Welcome to our Social Impact, brought to you by the Prison Scholar Fund. The PSF's mission is to provide education and employment assistance to help currently and formerly incarcerated people succeed and thrive in society, while avoiding homelessness and the revolving door of re incarceration. The PSF also advocates for reform and correctional education to increase opportunity for all. As a nonprofit, we rely on investments, volunteers, and are always looking for board members to champion our mission. Please connect with us through our website at prisonscholars.org, where you can find volunteer opportunities, make a contribution, and learn more about becoming a board member. You can also email us at info at prisonscholars.org and find us through most social media platforms at Prison Scholars. Become a patron by supporting us directly at Patreon with at Prison Scholars. We appreciate your review of this podcast through whatever platform you listen through. Without further ado, here's Dirk Van Velsen, founder and CEO of the Prison Scholar Fund. Okay, so today on Our Social Impact, we're interviewing Hakeem Crampton at the Jackson College. Is it Jackson? Is there a second part to it or just Jackson College? Yep, Jackson College. Okay, and this is in what part of Michigan? Jackson, Michigan. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Mm-hmm. And of course, we met at the Just Leadership USA training program. So kind of tell me how, you know, before we get to how we met at JLUSA, maybe tell me how you got here and some of the history of the Jackson College. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> I, I began coming out to Jackson College speaking um, uh, at Jackson College um, right after my release from prison. Um, I came here, was invited here as a guest speaker to a program called the Men of Merit. Um, and in that program class at that time was a young man named Antoine Breedlove, who now is the program manager of Men of Merit. Yeah, I just and, met um, him, and we'll talk to him later. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And um, so I was invited out here to be a speaker, to speak to young men who were first year, second year in college. Um, some of them had criminal histories and backgrounds. Um, and so I was invited out here um, by the director of Save Our Youth, Thomas Burke, um, to speak to these young men and to share with them my life story, the trajectory of my life, um, where I had gone, how I had came from this city and found myself in a world of trouble. Um, went to prison and got out and came back to my community uh, as a voice in our community sharing my story. And so the college got wind of that and said, hey, you need to come out here and share your story out here. And so that was roughly 2008, eight nine maybe. Okay. Yeah. So you're a success story because so many people go right back to prison. Mm-hmm. I think it's 68% in three years, 75 in five years, and like 83% in nine years. Mm-hmm. So almost everyone goes back until something intervenes. Mm-hmm. So maybe if you, whatever you feel comfortable sharing about your story, mm-hmm. what were you doing before you changed? And what kind of made you change? Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, um, I grew up in a tumultuous era. The crack era yeah. of the mid '80s, and was that in Jackson? Yeah, Actually, yeah, okay. between Jackson, Lansing, Detroit. You know, it's kind of bounced around here and there. Um, you know, that era was very difficult, particularly on black males. Right, we were cited as an endangered species. Um, the early '80s was a great time. Um, we were in the hip hop era, break dance, you know, graffiti, rapping, things of that nature. But then the crack cocaine came around 1985, 86, and young people like myself um, that was growing up in communities of poverty, um, we were easy prey uh, to an epidemic like the crack cocaine epidemic that that gave a viability for people living in poverty to exploit it as an entrepreneur opportunity, right, as an underground um, business. Um, and so yeah. I got involved in the drug trade um, and pretty rapidly. Yeah, so you had business skills and you had hustle. You're just in the wrong market. In the wrong market, absolutely. Yeah. So pretty rapidly um, I moved through the drug game um, and, 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 and found myself, you know, entrenched in some of the most uh, negative uh, outcomes of the drug world, which is violence, you know, arrest records, things of that nature. And so I found myself involved in, you know, firearms, um, getting caught with firearms, using firearms to injure people, being shot myself, um, selling drugs, being, you know, associated with people who were, you know, fairly known drug traffickers, high level drug traffickers. Um, and then ultimately in 1991, I had got out from jail up in Ingham County, Lansing, uh, from getting caught with a firearm. 
um, decided to relocate to Milwaukee, decided maybe I'm going to start fresh and get out of my, my environment. So how much time did you have to do for the firearm? In that Just four case? months. Okay. Yeah, four months in the county jail. Were you a felon at that point? Before? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think in Washington we get five years if you're a felon with a firearm. So different yeah. states have different. Yeah, it, it, it was a two-year felony. Um, and because I was 17, it was the first time offender at that time, I was eligible for a reduced sentence, which could be anything from probation up to two years. Um, and so I got four years or four months probation and two years, four months incarceration, two years probation. Um, when I got out and went to Milwaukee, attempted to start fresh, and unfortunately that didn't work out so well. I, I, I got locked up for getting in a fight at the liquor store. Uh, that fight got me into custody. While in custody, um, the police played an interrogation game. They used a very strategic tactic to see if somebody knows, has knowledge, uh, information about unsolved crimes. Um, me and three of my friends, we actually didn't have knowledge of an unsolved crime that they were inquiring about. Um, there was an unsolved murder that happened three weeks prior um, to us coming in contact with the police. Um, they began to separate us into different interrogation rooms, ask each one of us, um, what do we know about the murder? None of us knew anything about it. Well, they responded by saying, well, your friends already admitted their involvement. That old technique. The yeah. old technique, the interrogation tactic. Same tactic they used on the uh, Central Park Jogger 5. Um, after you know a week in custody and in constant um, you know harassment in that fashion, uh, one young man named Mark Henry who was 19 years old, never had police contact before. Then he believed that we had confessed because the police told him that I confessed, so he yeah. believed them. And um, you know, essentially, they told him, you know, your best option is to you know confess yourself and say they did it. Yeah. That way, you can get off and they'll go to prison because they've already confessed, which we didn't. So he confessed to a crime he had no part. In um, that confession led to our trial. Yeah, he's evidence against you now. Yeah, yeah. So it led to our trial and our ultimate conviction and an imposition of a sentence of 45 years in prison. That's what I was sentenced to in 1991 at the age of 18. Um, fortunately for me, the Wisconsin Innocence Project picked up my case um, in the early 2000s um, and took a traditional, uh, a non-traditional route to get me out of prison, um, which they took my case to the Wisconsin parole chairman and said, hey, you got somebody in the prison who's innocent, and we recommend you discharge or release him on parole. And that's what happened. Um, he, he heard my case out, you know, listened to the, the, to the um, attorneys, my mother, community activists, and he said, I'm going to let him out, and he let me out on parole. So how many years did you do before you got sprung? Yeah, I spent 15 years in prison um, for a crime I didn't commit, and... Um, Got released in 2006. Okay. And I immediately came back home right here to Jackson, um, began working in our schools and our juvenile homes, and ultimately right here at the college. So how do you kind of internalize that when you're doing time in a prison for something you didn't do? What, what does that feel like? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I approached it from a different point of view. Um, I recognized that um, I had gotten away with a lot of crimes. Yeah. I had, like I said, used firearms and injured people with firearms and weren't convicted of those of those. Uh, but you're in the game, kind of. Right, yeah. right, right. And so I looked at it as, in spite of being in prison for a crime I didn't commit, I'm going to assume responsibility um, for my condition um, and, and, and take it upon that my incarceration is just punishment for the crimes I actually did commit. Yeah. And I... Somebody actually had a really similar perspective, and he had a term for it. I forget what it was called, like, just because, or like, a Sunday crime, which is like, I didn't do this one, mm -hmm. but I did all these other ones they couldn't get me for. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just call it a wash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I call it a poetic justice. Yeah. You know, it was a form of poetic justice. I'd gotten away with a lot of things, and here it was now getting convicted of something I didn't do. And that really sounds like Ronald had, you know, Ronald in our jail, USA mm -hmm. program, he had a really similar perspective. He was, you know convicted for something he didn't do, but mm -hmm. he also said, look, man, I wasn't innocent. I had done all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. He just got me for this one, yeah. so call it good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he was blessed to get his conviction overturned. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still fighting to get it overturned, and hopefully I will. Oh, to get it off the record? Yeah. Because right now you're still convicted felon. Still you, convicted, you, still on parole, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, 13 years later. So how long is your parole? Is that kind of the rest of the 45-year sentence? Yep, absolutely, till 2036. But I'm challenging that now because they did pass new administrative code policy in Wisconsin that allows you to be discharged after two years. So I've been out 13 years. So I'm going back to Wisconsin next month uh, with an attorney, actually, to file a motion to get discharged. Okay, so this is a Wisconsin crime. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're a probation or a parole officer. They're kind of cool because I, I met you in New York City. Mm -hmm. We're in Michigan right now. So it sounds like you have some 
kind of loose leash, so to speak? Not necessarily. You know, um, travel here in the state of Michigan, um, you can travel if it's work related. Um, and for one, because I work for Just Leadership, um, when I travel for Just Leadership, it's work related. And secondly, they do let you travel also for school, for education purposes. And so when I was a fellow last year, I wasn't working for Just Leadership, but I was a fellow um, in a program. So they allowed me to travel for those purposes as well. Oh, I just thought that maybe a lot of our listeners don't know what Just Leadership is. Do you right. want to give a, a explanation? Yeah, absolutely. So Just Leadership USA was founded in 2014 by Glenn Martin, a formerly incarcerated man. Um, who had a great idea um, recognizing that um, those closest to the problem are those closest to the solution, but they are the ones furthest away from resources and power to do something about that. And so he created an organization that would empower formerly incarcerated persons or persons with criminal history um, to have the kind of training, the leadership development and training needed to insert their voice in the spaces and places in which they had been deprived, that they had been excluded from, the tables of decision making that they had been excluded from, um, both political tables, policy tables, um, um, decision tables, uh, Department of Corrections tables, for example, um, any any area in which there's there's a discussion um, about what to do with regard to people that have criminal histories. Part of the conversation, and, yeah. and we're not in those conversations. So the program is a leadership development organization. Um, it's also very heavily um, advocacy uh, rooted, um, and, and the training is very specific to leadership development and advocacy training to give people like us an opportunity to. Uh, not only have the professional skills and the training needed to insert our voice, but to, to be inserted in an effective way. Because we can be at the table, but is what we're saying going to be impactful and effective enough to change the outcome of the discussions we're having? Yeah. So it sounds like you're doing a lot of things. So kind of maybe talk about you get out of prison from the uh, Innocence Project. Mm -hmm. Then what happened? Did you just get a job at Dairy Queen and just start <laughs> living your life? Or did, were you sprung right into the uh, criminal justice reform yeah, arena? Yeah, yeah. Actually, while I was incarcerated, I started working in, in advocacy. Um, while I was incarcerated, I participated in a program called Teach the Teachers. Um, this is a program by Milwaukee inner city educators who came to the prison to learn from incarcerated men, um, to learn from us um, uh, exactly what they need to know to help their youth stay out of prison. So we engaged them over a two-year period, um, two older gentlemen and two younger gentlemen. I was one of the younger gentlemen at that time. So that doesn't sound like a scared straight program? No, not at all. We, yeah. we, we, it, it, it really was an opportunity for us to act as teachers. Yeah, how do you reach? Because I remember, if I think back, a lot of people tried to reach me. And I was like, mm -hmm. ah, I wouldn't listen to anybody. So how do yeah. you how do you how do you connect to people that don't want to listen? Presumably. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the ways we do that first and foremost is we need to be understanding um, of some of the things that are happening to young people. Um, too often times we're judgmental of their decisions and we judge their decisions, and so we approach the conversation with them in order to intervene to help them from a judgmental point of view. And that judgmental point of view for a young person um, that hasn't developed their their, their sensory skills yet, their judgment skills, um, you know, that that's not the right approach for them. Yeah, I think I, like the brain doesn't fully develop till age 25 yeah, or so. Yeah, yeah. So you want to build a relationship with them first and foremost. Um, building a relationship with young people um, is the easiest way to actually have the opportunity to impact the decisions they make. Because once you have that 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 relationship, then you're able to engage in a in a, in a dialogue that is mutual. Right. Where now you're sharing with them and they're sharing with you. You're accepting of what they're sharing and they're accepting of what you're sharing. That's where you're going to have the most impact at because then their ears are going to be open to your advice, to your counsel, to the recommendations and referrals you may make to them about getting their lives together. Because now you have a relationship. You're not just talking at them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's what I've done. I developed those skills in prison, um, working with teacher teachers, started doing program evaluation for a nonprofit organization, program development, um, and built relationships from prison with organizations in the community. Um, so that by the time I came home, I had to have a job, of course. And so luckily, a good friend of mine that I grew up with um, 
his brother is a cousin of mine. He offered me a job in a clothing retail store. He had a chain of retail stores. Ultimately worked my way up in management in that in that business. And while I was there, I began using that as a platform, as being a, a um, you know not a business owner per se, but working in the business field, using it as an opportunity to then mentor students. So I began mentoring students um, um, as a manager of a clothing store, offering them opportunities to come into the store um, to do internships. Um, providing fashion shows into the schools, just building that relationship with with young people, and you know, in, in schools up in Lansing. Um, while while I was simultaneously crossing the state, sharing my story of what happened to me, who I was, my incarceration history, uh, my life experiences, um, and then I created what's um, what's called Amen for Youth, um, uh, education consulting firm, in which I then began providing education services, consulting services to schools and juvenile centers um, through a program called Amen for Youth, the Academic Mentoring Education Network. Um, through Amen for Youth, I created a curriculum called Slam Lyrical Education. It's an English language arts, hip hop based pedagogy. Um, that teaches students how to better um, utilize their English skills um, using spoken word poetry as a medium for that. Now, I, th- and I think you mentioned that like in 2014 you had a big grant you were navigating yeah, through. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you're pretty successful. And don't grants normally go for nonprofits, but in this case you can apply for a grant as a Yeah, because I, I use a fiduciary, a nonprofit fiduciary, um, to, to, to do some of the work that I do because oftentimes the work that I do isn't, per se for profit, but I operate in a for profit business model. Gotcha. So I do do nonprofit work as well through this agency. So you have like a fiscal sponsor with a, another nonprofit. Right. Okay. Absolutely. So tell me some great stories out of that. Yeah, so you know, ironically, like the work that I do, a hip hop based pedagogy, you would think that, you know, it's you know, hip hop is, you know, African American, Latino culture centered. Well, ironically, you know, some of the greatest students I work with are non-African American, non-Latino. Um, some of the greatest students that's benefited from my program have been white students, right, who who found in my program um, a, a real successful way to engage English language arts. English is difficult for everyone. I found a way to teach it uh, in a very easy method, right, using lyrics, using rhyme, using songs. Everybody we know has a song, at least one song memorized in some capacity or another so I use that same model of the uh, the composition the writing composition the lyric writing composition um, as a basis to teach English language arts so they can you know really better their communication skills and their writing skills so here's a story so through this work you know like I say I, I speak in schools and present my program in schools and, and whatnot so I was um, starting off working at a, a school for a new school year um, here in town, Jackson, Michigan, and um, I had shared my story um, and the work that I do with a group of students in, in a civics class, and I was coming back the following week for my first follow-up discussion, right? And so I was walking up to the third floor, and I was on the first floor, and as I was walking through the hallway of the, the stairwell, I could hear some students talking. So it was a young lady who was talking. She's narrating this this interactive story um, about how just last night, the night before, she was with um, a group of friends. And that group of friends friends decided to uh, break in some cars. And who is she talking to at this point? She's point? talking to another group of students. Okay. Yeah, she's talking to her colleagues. And... Um, as she's telling them the story of how they were decided to break in store or break in cars, she said at that moment she made a decision to walk away based on the fact that some man had came to her class and told her and them his story about how he had went to prison for a crime he didn't commit. And she was like, I'm not about to get, get locked up tonight. So she left that group. Um, and subsequently, some things happened with the group that remained in broken cars that night. And as I was walking up the stairwell and got to the top of the stairwell, she saw me and said, that's him. Huh. That's the guy who came in my class and told me the story. And she ran up to me and hugged me and thanked me for my story because it saved her that's from a, an arrest. A, that's a pretty direct impact absolutely absolutely that must have felt good absolutely it, it, it was confirmation that you know the work i'm doing is is impactful and you always wonder like that's the story you actually saw face to face you always wonder how many how many other people did you impact that you never really know about absolutely and how do you measure those how, you can't measure that 
Tell me about the grant you're applying for right now. Yeah, so the grant I'm uh, working on now, um, I'm still working in education, of course, and uh, through through Amen for You, the Academic Mentoring and Education Network, we provide educational services. So right now I'm working in, in a new important field, a field I've been working in. I've been working in uh, ACEs, uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences, training and teaching about the impact of ACEs in, in students' and children's lives and how that affects their educational attainment. So right now we're working on a series called the Trauma-Informed Education Seminar Series. This series series is a deeply rooted series in generational trauma, the types of generational trauma that persist throughout a person's life over the course of their generations. And so specifically, we're targeting what has happened with racial segregation and social injustice that has impacted the African-American community and how those traumas have been passed down post-slavery from generation to generation right up to our very times in which we have people living in trauma that was experienced generations ago. Um, so we're educating Educating our community, our professionals, our therapists, our counselors, our social workers, um, our educators, and our community about trauma impacts and how those generational traumas are impacting us and what we can do about those impacts. So this series is a 12-part series. It's going to take place over the course of an entire year. We started in July. We'll finish in July of next year. Um, we have eight different trainers. Your next guest is one of our trainers. She presented last night on the trauma of child abuse and neglect. Um, one of the other gentlemen we met in the hallway, uh, Dr. Clevester Moten, he was with Dean Baskin. He's one of our trainers as well. He'll be training and talking about the trauma of police encounters and how that uh, impacts our lives. And so this is a very important grant I'm working on um, that hopefully is going to continue to fund us. Um, and then next year, perhaps, we're, we're applying for a small grant to fund this, this project. But hopefully next year, we're going to apply for their big grant that would then allow us to have that training as a large conference right here at the college right so that people can come and participate in an all-day conference with breakout sessions plenary sessions etc very cool so i met you at jlusa and you also mentioned something about advocacy so mm -hmm. do you have a are you affected there do you do you do you kind of dip into the advocacy maybe in dc or, or the state legislature and it sounds like your stories mm -hmm. would really be effective too yeah, absolutely. So after I graduated last year, you know, Just Leadership, uh, Leading with Conviction Fellowship was great for me. Um, I was offered a job at Just Leadership. Um, so I ultimately got hired working for Just Leadership um, as one of their campaign advocacy leaders uh, here in the state of Michigan. I'm their Michigan statewide organizer. Um, Working through the Working Future campaign, which is a nationwide campaign, um, the Just Leadership uh, leads. Um, we have campaigns in you know four different states right now, Michigan being one of them. Um, the current campaign we're working on in the state of Michigan that I'm advocating for is the expansion of felony ex expungement and clean slate, the introduction of clean slate, so that we can expand uh, the, the eligibility and qualifications for those that um, – who have criminal histories and need to get those criminal histories expunged from their record so they can move on with their life. Are you, are you working on like legalization of marijuana issues or anything like that? Not directly. Um, w we have no direct involvement with that per se, but for those that do have criminal records of marijuana history, yeah. that's a part of the expungement package bill that we're also advocating for that, you know, no matter what crime a person has, marijuana included, because now marijuana is legal in the state of Michigan, even recreational marijuana is, we're advocating that those people who have criminal histories, um, who have been out of jail or prison or have had a criminal history as, as a history, that they in fact have opportunity to get that expunged that's why it's so important it's like you know these laws weren't passed down by the hand of god it's like as a society we decided marijuana is bad you're convicted mm -hmm. of it and at one point we decide oh i guess it's not so bad after all and it's legal so that's why it's really important these things go retroactive because mm -hmm. i mean is the crime because you had marijuana or was it a crime against the state you know so absolutely it's it, a very important topic to have you know especially in light of the marijuana legalization across the country yeah yeah, I just came from, you know, Chicago, and they, they just passed that law recently. Mm -hmm. So kind of talk about the expungement. How does somebody apply for expungement? Is it a, a, a period that has to go elapse with no new crimes? Or Yeah, yeah. So the current law that we're hoping to expand right now, we have a bill that's been introduced. Um, we've had hearings on the bill. Hopefully that bill will get passed, um, which is a little bit more expansive. But I can talk about how the current bill is. So the current law, I should say, um, the eligibility qualifications is one felony, two misdemeanors. So if you have one felony, two misdemeanors, you qualify. If if one of you, if you, one of your convictions or more of your convictions is not um, a disqualifier, which is like you know life sentence, um, CSC criminal sexual conduct uh, degrees one through three, um, child abuse. Uh, um, 
uh, certain dr- uh, traffic con- convictions are excluded. So there's just a like small ve- amount of vehicular homicide, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there's other vehicle codes. Not even that. You know, we have um, uh, such things as uh, DUIs and OWIs. Those okay. things disqualify you from from felony expungement or from expungement period. And so right now the process is um, you have to apply for it. So you have to jump through a whole lot of hurdles or a whole lot of hoops. You have to get yourself fingerprinted. Um, you have to get a certified record of your conviction history. You have to get a background check, an iChat background check. Um, you have to get your documentation certified by notary. Um, you have to fill out an application. You have to pay for the application. Um, and then you have to make notification to the attorney general and the county prosecutor. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff to navigate through if, if you're not... If you're not a paperwork pushing kind of person, very difficult. Um, Ninety-three point five percent of people um, don't. Well, out of a hundred percent of the people um, who are eligible for expungement, ninety-three point five percent don't even apply. And yet they're eligible. They could have their conviction expunged, but they don't even apply. And then, like in my case, you know, I don't have any of the disqualifying crimes. Mm-hmm. But I have a lot of crimes. Mm-hmm. So I have, you know, a, a lot of misdemeanors. Mm-hmm. Probably, you know, I don't know, eight to ten felonies. Mm-hmm. So is there some board you can say, hey, these things probably knock me off the official eligibility roster? If, you know, I've been doing good. Is there some way to present a case to to get you know mm-hmm. get past the, the the rules? Yeah, unfortunately, the way our law is set up in Michigan, that's not the case, and that's what we're trying to expand. We really want to expand the number. We we, we really want to do away with the number system, right? With uh, how many uh, felonies you have. To us, that is inconsequential. To have you changed your life? Yeah. Are you doing the right things? That's what's more important. So we're looking at a, a introducing clean slate, which automates the expungement process. And we want that. We want it to happen. For example. If you have, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 felonies, to after a certain period of time that you've demonstrated that you have, in fact, changed your life and you're doing good, to automatically drop it off. And that's another issue, too, is like, even if there's a review board, who's on the review board? Because I remember I did a clemency from prison, mm-hmm. and that didn't go very far because mm-hmm. everyone on the, on the clemency board, they're sheriffs, prosecutors, ex-judges, mm-hmm. you know, the law enforcement community, and some of my crimes were against law enforcement. So... Mm-hmm. It's really hard to, you know, poke the bear and then ask for forgiveness. Right. So, what is who's who's on these committees that might? Yeah, it's essentially the prosecutor and the judge. Yeah. So right, prosecutor makes a recommendation or opposes your your application, and it goes before a judge, and you you know you have your moment to stand before him. That's even if you qualify, though. You yeah. get the, if you don't qualify, it's rejected it, it, out the gate. Gotcha. Yeah. Because there's really no, there's no one you can appeal to. No, and, and well, that's one of the things that's been proposed is what's called a community review board, um, um, so that we could submit our case before a community review board, and then they can make a recommendation. And that re- community re- review board might have some community members absolutely. as opposed to law enforcement. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And how is how is law enforcement receptive to you? What you do. You know, I have a great relationship with law enforcement, actually. Um, our chief, our current chief, Elmer Hitt, um, our previous chiefs, uh, Mr. Hines, before them. I've had great relationships with them. Um, I sit on, you know, coalitions with them together. We meet. We just met the other day with our chief of police here through AWPAC. Um, and so I have great relationships with them. In fact, um, the chief of police wrote a letter of recommendation to the pro board that I be discharged. Isn't it kind of funny that kind of all of our criminal lives we were uh – at odds with the police. You know, mm-hmm. we were, they were on one side, we are playing cops and robbers. Mm-hmm. But now that we're kind of in this work, we almost have the same the same goals. Like, we all want self, safer communities, we mm-hmm. want people not to go to prison, mm-hmm. and so, you know, there's a lot of commonality. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's important that we do work together. It's important that we find a way to bridge uh, what gaps there have been to our relationship, right? And so that's, I think that that's important for us to do that to, because for one, when we're playing cops and robbers, for example, we're the enemy to them, and they're the enemy to us. Yeah. And the only way we're going to really make progress in building a better community is to remove those barriers and sit down and work together as a community. So what's next for you? Well, next for me, honestly, is I'm trying to take the work that I'm doing um, to a broader national base. Like, I've been around the country. I've done things around the country. But I really, really want to... Um, 
take the work that I'm doing national, especially the work I'm doing in schools and the educational advocacy work that I'm doing. I really want to impact the nation. I really want to have a greater impact. Yeah, it sounds like your program could be scalable, but mm-hmm. also you can impact the nation through maybe policy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, education right now, you know, is, is secondary to a lot of politicians. We're constantly removing funding from it. Um, we're losing schools. Right. And so I think that we need to really um, talk about the importance of education and how vital it is to, you know, our success as, as Americans. Right. Our communities have been over policed for a very long time. And the, the problem with community supervision, like for me, for example, I've been in community supervision for 13 years. When is it ever going to end? Yeah. You know, that's traumatizing in itself. And is there a process where you can apply for uh, for that to stop? Well, like I said, prior to a couple of years ago, there was no process. You just you were stuck. It's the law. You had to do your entire sentence. Now they've changed their administrative code and their policy on parole, and you can request discharge up to two years. So I'm in that process now, requesting discharge. I've okay. actually requested it earlier this year and got denied. So the next step is to take it to court and have a, a court review the denial. It's a really funny story there is uh – Right when I got out of prison, I was building my prisoner, you know, the Prison Scholar Fund, the Prisoner mm-hmm. Education Program. And I was talking to a lot of people in the Washington State Department of Corrections, mm-hmm. some of the head people, some of the, the secretary, the, mm-hmm. their uh, administrators, the people in charge of the education. Mm-hmm. And then basically the one-year mark, my probation officer said, hey, uh, you're off custody. And I actually had three years to do. So I told her, I go, hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And she goes, oh, don't thank me. It wasn't my call. It's like, oh, well, uh, <laughs> what happened then? So she didn't really want to talk about it. But then I found out from someone else that every time I talk to somebody that works for the DOC, they have to file a report. So I was talking to them two or three times a week. And after a year of this, in the DOC staff were, get this guy out of community custody because every time he calls us, we have to file a report. Mm-hmm. So I kind of beat them up with paperwork. And they <laughs> said, you know, they, they, I think they realized that I wasn't the one they had to worry about. Yeah, yeah. So as soon as they exhausted that, then I called my federal probation officer. I was like, hey, do you guys also have a process where I can get off community custody? And she's like, ah, oh, yeah. And, and she, she only said one word. She goes like, she gave me some code. It was like 1023 or something. Mm-hmm. So I Googled it, and I found out the process. It turns out I still had my federal probation officer, mm-hmm. I mean my federal public defender. Mm-hmm. So I called her up and said, hey, let's start this ball rolling. Mm-hmm. And the funniest story there is when I get to court, uh, you go back to the same judge that sentenced you. Mm-hmm. And in this case... Um, I had, I got out of prison. I was like one year out of prison, of course, and I had already gone through Stanford. They had a really cool social entrepreneurship mm-hmm. program. They published something I wrote in one of their magazines. So I had all this really cool stuff, and g- generally the judge hears all of this in chambers. You don't even get a court hearing. Mm-hmm. But he goes, he goes, I remember you. I mm-hmm. remember sentencing you because I, you know, I did all this crazy stuff. And he goes, I could have just read this at Chambers, but since I'm such a perfect judge of character, I wanted to see you in person. Hmm. <laughs> so he's making a joke out of it. And he was totally cool. So he, he loved everything I was doing. And then when hmm. the prosecutor started speaking, she just went off on all these terrible things I had been convicted of. I'm a threat to society. They need to keep watching me. And then the judge goes, uh, it's the funniest thing in the world. He goes, Mr. Van Velzen, you might remember me. I'm the one that sentenced you. He go, and then he goes, you might remember Dolores. She was a court, court reporter at the time. You might remember Emily. She was the, uh, the bailiff. Mm-hmm. And then he goes, do you remember Susan? No, you probably don't mo- know her because she was, she was 13 at the time, but she was now the, the court aide. He goes, so basically everyone is here that was here when you got convicted, except for two people. The pre-sentence investigator guy isn't here because he's forcibly, forcibly removed from the court. And also your, your, your sentencing prosecutor isn't here because uh, he was running a prostitution ring. <laughs> so it's kind of his message to the prosecutor, like, before you start throwing rocks at Dirk, maybe clean up your own house. Mm-hmm. So, of course, he, he granted my uh, release from supervision. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So how long have you been off supervision now? Two years? Yeah, so that was uh, my re- – I call it my rebirthday. When mm-hmm. I got out of prison, my rebirthday was May 5th – or May 7th, 2015. Mm-hmm. And then almost a year after that, I was off su- supervision. And right. I could travel and just be a regular mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. And then you're not paying 100 bucks a month for – supervision fees mm-hmm. or whatever they're charging for mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and like all, all these trips to the office yeah 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 that's definitely a good thing to be off you know supervision to be honest with you i've been on supervision since i was 11 years old i haven't lived a day outside supervision since then 
Oh, when did your your criminal history start? So it started with me first getting picked up by police when I was ten years old, getting taken back home. You know, car prowling or just being a no, nah, just running around, running around doing stupid stuff, and you know, police gets called, they come pick you up, take you home to your mom. Um, and when I was eleven years old, just before I turned twelve, a few months before I turned twelve, I got arrested at my school for throwing rocks at recess and hitting a staff member, unfortunately. Um, and they prosecuted me, charged me with a felony assault. Really? Yeah. And um, I got convicted, served juvenile time, was, got put on probation, and pretty much have always been on probation no since kidding. then. You know, gotten another conviction, you know, got locked up again, got rearrested and until I became an adult. So what was your family life like at this point? Did you have a good structure at home, mm-hmm. mom and a dad? Mm-hmm. Yep, I had my mother was in my life my entire life, you know, my mother, my brother, um, and my father. Unfortunately, my father was, you know, a hustler. He migrated from the south in 1964 with his family. He was the oldest sibling. Um, so he dropped out of school to help my grandmother take care of the rest of the, the family. And um, he began hustling to make a living for himself, um, being a high school dropout, you know, from the south. Um, and he persisted in hustling all his all his life until he passed away in ninety six. So that's kind of your role model. Yeah, so absolutely, speak. absolutely, absolutely. And so he was very successful um, as a hustler. Um, never went to prison. Never went to jail. You know. Um, so I always had both parents in my life. I just had that. Uh, you know. You know. Sometimes you know you got a book, and you know the front cover is very nicely designed and decorated. You know, my mom was on the front cover of the book, and you flip it on the back, and it's just like you know it doesn't match the same as the front cover. It's just some words back there, and you know some book reviews or something. You know what I mean? So it's just not as as alluring as the front cover, right? So um, the back portion of my life was in the underground. Yeah. You know, as a result, and so you know, life was good in the beginning. You know, we had the hip hop air, break dancing, sp- spray painting graffiti, all that good stuff. You know, like I said, when the crack cocaine epidemic hit us, it, it took us black boys, you know, hard. And, you know, we got lost in the shuffle. Yeah. We really did. So it's so important to have role models. Remember when Danny in our, in our cohort mm-hmm. was talking about role models? Like, you know, when he grew up, his role model was what he wanted to achieve was to go to Pelican Bay and come back and have street cred. Mm-hmm. So I guess your program kind of does that a little bit, huh? Yeah, helps, yeah, helps, yeah. That's a different model of what you aspire to. Absolutely. And the thing about it is this, is that unlike a lot of mentors in communities, a lot of those mentors aren't uh, tangible. You can't reach out and touch them. You know, you see them in your school when they come to speak to you or whatever. Whereas me, I live in our community, the community I work with. I walk my dog through the community. I ride my bike through the community. Um, I show up at various places where kids are at, and they see me, and they walk up to me, and they say, hey, I remember you. Do you remember me? You know, and so I'm tangible to them. Another thing that I do through my program, Amen for Youth, we offer, you know, educational um, opportunities. And so I have a series of textbooks, grades 4 through 12. So when I leave the classroom, while I'm in the classroom, when I leave the classroom, we're leaving children with education books, books that, that are workbooks that they can engage in. Um, and <clears throat> what I found... <clears throat> What I found is that these kids really, really love these books. Like, they will debate with you about their book. Like, they want their book now. So if I start (laughs) the program on day one, they want the book on day one. And if the teacher says, you need to leave the book in the class until you finish the program, then you can take it home. They, like, no, I want my book to go home today. You know what I mean? Because that that they're so hungry for it. They're so hungry for it because they've never had anything. just, Just think about it. So often our young people, particularly when it comes to hip hop, um, are negatively, um, you know, spoken to about rap music. Today's rap music is unfortunately, you know, pretty misogynistic, pretty violent, right? Pretty filled with profanity. So if you have an opportunity to be in your classroom, in your history class, your English class, your civics class, even your math class, and you can use rapping lyrics poems to do your schoolwork you're going to change the entire dynamics of the relationship of that student with their classroom coursework that's fast you know meet them where they are meet them where they are right and so the, my program builds upon that level of engagement with the classroom coursework so we take classroom coursework and i train them using my textbooks how to then take their classroom coursework coursework chop it up 
regurgitated back as a lyric, as a song, as a rap, as a poem. Instead of just uh, wrote, you know, blind testing and right, right. Instead of them just you facts. know, right, absolutely. So that way, the information that they rhyme about is their classroom coursework, and that information they could then receive a grade for. That's really interesting, and I, I wonder how the longevity of that type of learning. Because mm-hmm. I, I know some of my classes, I would, I would study, and I'm a terrible test taker, mm-hmm. so I would study. Mm-hmm. I would, I'd really prepare for the exam, which was really hard for me. And then I swear probably a couple months later, I wouldn't remember any of it. Right. But if I turned it into a song, of course, I'm probably not a songwriter, but mm-hmm. if I were, it would probably stick with you longer. Yeah, yeah. Like, for example, my last book is called We've Got Words, A High School Student's Guide to the Parts of Speech and Public Speaking. And the book is based on a student that I worked with who wrote a rap about the parts of speech, where she is literally describing things and describing it as either a preposition, a conjunction, a verb, a noun. And so it's easy to memorize what a noun is, what a verb is, by, by this method. Actually, that's really effective. I remember when I was a kid, there's a thing called schoolhouse rock, mm-hmm. like the conjunction mm-hmm. conjunction yeah. function or, yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. And you totally remember all of that yeah. stuff. Yeah, and see, the problem, as great as programs are like that, the problem with our educational institutions is we think that that model only works in preschool and first and second well, grade. Kid. But no, it persists throughout the life of, an, of a student, whether adult or young, right? And we need to find a way, and that's what I've done, is found a way to keep that model going even into high school. Fascinating. So that sounds like there's more to come. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely more. I'm actually working on a book, another, I got three manuscripts. I've written so many books, uh, over two dozen books, actually, and okay. I have eight of them published. Oh, so we can find them on Amazon? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, r- run down some titles. Yeah, well. Plug it. <laughs> yeah, what you what you have to do to get my books on Amazon is to, to re- or search under Amazon, uh, Slam Lyrical Education. That will pull up all of my books, right? Or Slam my, Lyrical Education. Yeah, or my name, Hakeem Crampton, in Amazon. As an author, I'm a published author, it'll bring up all my books. So we'll have that uh, on the video spelled mm-hmm. out, but for the listeners, just H A K I M. Yeah, H A K I M C R A M P T O N. All right. Yeah. And and do you have a website too? Yeah, lyricaleducation.wordpress.com, as well as amenforyouth.yolasite.com. Um, but I'm working on a book. Um, one of my important books I'm working on um, um, is 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 uh, uh, what's called going to be called Lyricionary. Right. Lyricionary is a dictionary of of words that are in my textbooks. So I have six textbooks and there's literally hundreds of words in there. And these words that are in this textbook are actually words that were born out of the vocabulary of students that I worked with in classrooms. That's right. So all of the words in there are actually the vocabulary and diction that students use and used. And so this next book is going to be called Lyricionary, and it's going to really break down how these words are used in a lyrical format, right? So um, it's going to be a unique, unique approach to uh, etymology, right? And so how many of those books did you write when you were incarcerated? Um, Well, out of the books that are published right now, Two of the books were books that the bulk of the material comes from books that I wrote in prison. You just kind of got out, refined it a little bit. Absolutely. Like one book, the entire book was written in prison called Hip Hopology 101. Um, That book was written in prison, the entire book. Um, And um, what I did was the only thing I added to that was my new model, my educational model that I created. Um, I added the model um, to it so it fits in with the same curriculum, right? Another important book of mine is Our School Life, which for you, people like you and I who have criminal history, we would love to see a world in which young people don't go to prison. So this book is called Our School Life, an anthology of students' lyrics and stories about getting off the school to prison pipeline, right? For those young people that drop out of high school, find themselves ultimately incarcerated, this book charts um 12 stories of 12 middle school students um, between the ages of 12 and 14 um, who were who have been identified as potentially um, being in prison in the future because they're in an alternative school. They have low literacy scores They come from communities of poverty. And through this book, they talk 
through their stories of their lives and how they have developed plans about getting off this pipeline to prison and w w what type of success they would like to have in their life. And then there's annotations for me as their instructor where I'm reviewing uh, my relationship with them. It's really interesting that you're working in that space because I think in Washington State, they kind of calculate the fourth grade dropout rate mm -hmm. to figure out how many prisons to build in the future. Mm -hmm. So you think they would try to address the fourth grade dropout rate to mm -hmm. keep people from dropping out, but they really, really don't. That's right. And that's, that's a little right. bit further upstream than you. That's right. And that's because by the fourth grade, what, what we're able to chart by the fourth grade is two major things. Attendance level. Right, which could be by suspension, expulsion, um, or just uh, absence from school. You can school. project, oh, he's going to prison anyway. Yeah, so call yeah. It good. Because students who miss uh, about 10 days per year, right, are students who ultimately are the ones that drop out, right, or are pushed out, right, and find themselves in juvenile custody or adult incarceration. And that number um, is the indicator. But simultaneous with those kids up to the fourth grade who are missing 10 days or more, their literacy scores are lower because they are missing class. That, that critical, like one single day of absent from class could potentially equate to about a week's worth of learning. Just missing one day. Okay. Right? So if you're missing 10 days, you're potentially missing 10 weeks of educational engagement. You're, you're behind your classmates. You're behind. Yeah. So for four years or five years, so by the time you're in fourth grade, you've really been in school for five years. So if you add those that time up, by the time you're in the fifth or fourth grade, getting ready to go to fifth grade, your literacy scores are so low because you've been absent for so long. And those are the students who continue to persist at the absentee level. And those are the students who drop out. And then we get people to come to prison. 75% of people in prison are people who had dropped out of school. Yeah. And it all ties back into the fourth grade literacy scores. Yeah, I remember helping a tutor people in prison. They couldn't read. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they look like normal people, talk like normal people. Yeah. And then like they're, I, I tried to encourage them to do some schoolwork. And, you know, they would you know, shamefully admit to me, like, mm -hmm. man, I can't read. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's get working on it, you know, but there's, there's such a huge problem. Yeah. Um, and why do they figure out at the fourth grade all these, all these things are happening? Is it a family structure issue or is there what, – what, what is making this yeah, happen? Yeah, there, there's a lot of cross-sections. Um, poverty is a key indicator, right? So oftentimes people come from communities of poverty, right? Um, family structures. Children that are coming from single-parent households um, who are in poverty, chances are they don't have transportation. Mom's working full-time. Mom's working full-time or not working on, um, on, on assistance, government assistance, et cetera. Um, by coming from communities of poverty, it creates a whole or, or there's a whole other backdrop of issues for them, um, which could be coming from communities of violence, yeah. right? Um, those communities of violence produce traumatic moments and incidences. Children are raised in communities in which people are dying and being killed, right? So children are experiencing trauma in their community, coming from communities of poverty, coming from single parent households, and that contributes to them not attending school 100% of the time. And so they're displaying symptoms and signs of trauma when they get to school. They're being snapped, suspended, sent home early um, because their behavior is considered bad behavior, whereas it's signs and symptoms of trauma. Um, and then at the same time, parents that are ill-equipped to be parents aren't taking the initiative to make sure that their kids are in school. So how do we, I mean, short of your program, how do we help people when there's so much lacking? Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 one of the, I'm, that kind of discussion and that conversation is the conversation I'm having when I speak at universities. Like I speak at, you know, University of Michigan, Eastern Michigan University. Um, and that's the conversation I'm having with students that don't come from traditional backgrounds of troubled students. Right. Um, they're they this new generation is interested in learning more about how they could help because they're recognizing that the impact that this is having in society is impacting all of us no matter what background we come from and so psychology students social work students you know criminal justice students they are the people that we need to be having these conversations with to get them engaged, to figure out solutions and ways that we can continue to engage our populations that are struggling and that are vulnerable to incarceration. This is fascinating. It's funny, like every time we like touch a new subject, we could talk for about another hour about it. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you, Hakeem. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll, we'll follow up next. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome.